John Phillips is a very, very good writer. He said, there's no implied promise that we can have the best of both worlds. There's no intimation of Jesus, no suggestion that we can go on living the same old way and still be sure of heaven. Well, if you could turn tonight to uh, Matthew chapter 7. Uh, the verses that I read are part of uh, a larger sermon of Jesus in uh, Matthew uh, five, six, and seven. It's been called the the great sermon of the great king. And when you look through uh, this sermon of Christ, and there's a, uh, it's it's there in Luke as well, uh, spread throughout the Gospel of Luke. Uh, these chapters, in, in a sense, summarise the entirety of Christ's teaching. Uh, one writer said that that the principles of the kingdom that Jesus teaches. The principles of the kingdom living in his rule and under his reign are a shocking reversal of all that our world desires and seeks for. It's a shocking reversal. Uh, Christ will give us the exact opposite of what our world system will constantly seek to feed us with and overwhelm us with. The writer continued, the Lord takes Old Testament teaching, fills it with new meaning, and then elevates it to staggering heights. It leaves unbelievers convicted and believers illuminated for a new devotion to God. Now, the term Sermon on the Mount was uh, given to it by Augustine in the 4th century. I suppose someone would have given it that title at some point. But he gave us that expression, the Sermon on the Mount or Sermon on the Mountain. Apart from Genesis 1 and 2, uh, it's one of the best-known scriptures. Apart from the creation account itself. It's been called the nearest thing to a manifesto Jesus ever uttered. Or another, it's, it's a sermon on the holiness of God. Even the key, the key to the whole Bible. Now, it's not just believers who love the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, you'll find through history that many theological liberals are drawn to the sermon as well. Uh, many people who are drawn to the, the words of Jesus are uh, uh, yeah, seeking to find words of revolution, uh, yeah, insurrection, uh, social upheaval, uh, and, and every other thing that you can imagine if you take verses out of context. But actually, a true reading of this sermon, along with all of the New Testament, you know, it's not as though the words in red in the Bible are more merciful. You know, find the red ones, and, and uh, they're really, really important. Uh, no, red or, red or black letters. Uh, sometimes the, the, uh, the red letters, if you have that, as I do in, in the Gospels, it can be a little bit misleading. Uh, because uh, what, what Paul wrote and Moses wrote are just as part of Scripture as what Jesus said and is recorded. But we know that Jesus, from uh, Matthew uh, 5, verse 1, if you look at chapter 5, verse 1, it says that seeing the multitude, he went up on the mountain and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. And uh, many see a, a parallel from, from Moses going up to the mountain, receiving the Ten Commandments, and Jesus, in similar way, uh, going to an exalted place uh, so that he could speak to his disciples. Uh, Matthew Henry said that when the law was given, the Lord came down upon the mountain. Now the Lord goes up. Onto a mountain. Then he spoke in thunder and lightning, now in a still small voice. Then the people ordered to keep distance, now they are invited to draw near. And so there's this repeated contrast between Moses going away from the people, then coming back uh, to Jesus, uh, inviting those to hear. Well, who was this message for? Who was it actually for? Uh, in, in chapter 5, verse 1, we, 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 we see that there are multitudes, there's a mountain, and we have the disciples coming to him. Now, it might seem like the Lord is sort of moving away from the multitudes. 
But if you look at the very end of the sermon in Matthew 7, if you look at verse 28 and 29, and, and so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Uh, this sermon was, was for all those who were there, all the people, disciples and others who had, uh, who had gathered. The Lord was making room for people, just as he did later in Matthew 13 when he enters a boat so he could speak to those who had gathered on the shore. And what we're going to do this evening is look at, at uh, the, the conclusion, not the final conclusion. The final conclusion of the sermon is the the story of the wise man, the foolish man. But in Matthew 7, from 13 to uh, 23, uh, you have Jesus bringing the message to a conclusion. And he is calling people to make a decision to follow him. Uh, we read tonight in verse 13 of Matthew 7, to enter by the narrow gate. And this, this is a command of Christ to come to the narrow gate. Now, in the Old Testament, clearly the, the, the Bible talks about there being, you know, one true guide, and you've got all the alternatives, all the alternatives. Uh, you've got one tabernacle superseded by one, te uh, one temple. You've got one true guide well, that doesn't change in the New Testament. Uh, what you have in the New Testament is the true God uh, uh, enfleshed among them. There, standing before them, the God-man. And he says, come through the narrow way. It's singular. It has its difficulties. And the alternative, very easy. <laughs> Very, very easy. Enter by the narrow gate for, and this is the alternative, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And I went to the University of Technology, Sydney, uh, after high school, and it was uh, this, this building literally on Broadway. That was the name of the road as you entered into the city, and there was, you know, probably four lanes each side. And uh, it, 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 it was what it said it was. It was a very broad way. And, you know, thousands of cars go through, through Ultimo, Central, you know, Town Hall, and into the heart of the city. And there you had this UTS building uh, where I had my classes. It was literally a Broadway. This vast space uh, for cars, and the traffic was bad then. Traffic was bad in the, you know, the mid-90s. Scary thought, isn't it? It's a broad way. And there, there, there are many who go in, and so many are there because it is easy. It's easy. Now, the Lord's speaking in pictures here. Uh, we, we could add, we could add from other things that we know, that, that people are born on the Broadway, in fact. They're born on the Broadway. Uh, you, uh, you know, you don't, you know, no one is sort of born and grows up and, and, and you know, they make this, I'll, I'll choose the Broadway, thanks very much. We're all born sinners. We're born condemned by Christ and we are all on the Broadway Continuing on this way is not difficult because it's easy, it's comfortable. To change would involve some, uh, un some discomfort and some uh, changes. It says that there are many who are on it. But what about the narrow way, the narrow way? He says that, that it, is, it, is, it is difficult, verse 14. There's a difficulty there. And there are relatively few who find it. When all, when all said and done, and only God knows what the division is, but relatively few. 
Now, of course, when you look at the book of Revelation, you have countless saints before the throne of God. I mean, when you think about Earth's history and generation after generation, you have potentially you know, millions of believers. But you've had world populations of, of, of billions, essentially. But you've got a fairly distinct minority when all is said and done. How do you, you know, square this up with... Uh, there, there is a simplicity to salvation, is there not? And when you know, pretty little kids come to faith in Christ at an early age, uh, there's, there's not always that agony of soul. There's not always that... There's not an awareness of a lifetime of sin, that kind of thing, that, that can happen later on. But sometimes the difficulties come later. They come years later. But Christ is, is telling us that his way, though it leads to life, is no picnic. It's no picnic. Uh, yeah, Peter tells us, don't think it's strange. When, when fiery trials happen to you, you know, Imagine having a hard day and then, and then you get set on fire, right? And I'm trying to, yeah, that's not very pleasant, not very pleasant. Uh, Christian life has its challenges, its, its difficulties. Jesus taught us in John 14, 6, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is that way. The way is him. It's not through commandments. It's not through our own philosophies. It's through a person and the work of salvation that he has provided. So you have this very narrow pathway that can turn people off. It requires repentance. We saw from James, obedience to him. So you've got this narrow way, which is hard enough, and then you have an easy alternative, which makes it even harder. But then in verse 15, you've got people who are trying to keep others away from the narrow way. You've got false Prophets, false prophets. You've got people trying to get you away from what is good. He says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. So they're not going to come to you with a T-shirt that says, I'm a false prophet. Beware. I'm not going to have that. But they are going to look like harmless sheep. But inwardly, they are dangerous wolves. Okay. Now, it's one thing if they're a wolf in a wolf's clothing. That's easy to see. Uh, Winston Churchill, he had a political opponent who he didn't think much of, and he said he's a sheep in a sheep's clothing. Right? But it's, uh, it, 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 it's a wolf in a sheep's clothing clothing seem harmless they seem harmless and a lot of what they say is true it's true but you listen longer and you think deeper and these people are poison poison these are hungry wolves that are seeking to destroy uh, remember in Acts 20, Paul warns the Ephesian elders about those who would from, from within the assembly, from within the assembly, draw people away. And I think about, you know, uh, the, uh, you know the Baptists I've known over the last 30 odd years. And uh, I, I can think of probably maybe a handful of people, a handful of people that, that became wolves, became wolves. Uh, you know, teaching false doctrine or living scandalously and drawing people away in scandal, all right? It, 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 every, every group has them. And Jesus told us it would happen. Paul reminds us it would happen. You have a book called Galatians that, that, that warns against those who would mix law and grace, whether, whether the Old Testament law or, for us today, just morality, trying to blend them together. Now, the, the, the primary test for any teacher of God's, any teacher of, of, of God is the Bible. So at least we have, at least we have some guide, some guide. And so when you come across books or people, you know, whatever it is, whatever context it is, 
then be like those, those Bereans that search the scriptures. Uh, that's, that's our only, it's only truth serum we have. And yet we'll never, we, we're going to be duped by false teachers if we, if we don't know God's word. And that's, that's pretty plain, isn't it? If we don't know God's word, then we're going to be, uh, to mix metaphors, sitting ducks. Sitting ducks for these wolves that, that seek to draw people away. And by the way, in the Old Testament, uh, if, if, if a false prophet got anything wrong, they were condemned. Anything wrong. All right? If someone is going to claim that they got something from the Lord, just like Paul got his letters from the Lord, you know, and, right, and, and, and they are wrong in any respect, they don't get to try again. They get a second chance. They get to come back next week and improve their prophecy. Uh, that they are to be rebuked and to be uh, turned away from. So Jesus tells us that, hey, there, there's going to be those teaching falsehoods from time to time. They can be very attractive and very winsome, but you be very, very careful. Well, he gives us another indicator of how we evaluate truth from error, he says in verse 16, you'll know them by their fruits. By their fruits, what they produce. What they produce. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Obviously, no. Obviously, no. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears Bad fruit. It's the nature of the tree. It's the nature of the tree that determines the fruit. Now, you know, I guess you could go to a flower shop, Bunnings, whatever it is, and, and you could buy bags of, of seeds, of all sorts of fruits and whatever, and, and in the seed form, maybe some look very similar. Maybe some of these seeds, unless you, you got the label, you wouldn't know what it is. I wouldn't know what, what, what they were. But you start playing the seed and you water the seed and things start growing and you, you get to know what this thing is. And they start bearing fruit and it is very, very clear. Very, very clear. Every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. And he says in verse 19, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cast down and thrown into the fire. God judges that one. He judges that one. That's what it's getting at. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. And again, uh, you take a step back and what the Bible says about fruit in someone's life has to do with, with godliness and holiness and helping others to live for God and serve him. Is, is there good, definable, discernible fruit? Uh, a few weeks ago, I was, um, I was, I was listening to some, to some biographies of on the lives of uh, some of the early early Pentecostal preachers, I'm talking uh, early mid nine early mid nineteen hundreds, right? Some of the really early ones, and uh, some of these people had vast meetings across the United States, other countries. Uh, there there were he preachers and she preachers. And some of the she preachers had bigger audiences than the he ones, right? But what was interesting to me that 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 virtually to every every one of them, there, there was some kind of 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 scandal or utterly outrageous part of their of their teaching. People that were held up as these great evangelists and healers and prophets uh, couldn't get salvation right. <laughs> They couldn't clearly. They couldn't clearly explain what salvation is. It, it was remarkable. It's remarkable. Although there was one, there was one favorite miracle I got to tell you about. There was uh, with with one of the healers. Um, one of the uh, one, a lady went to the meeting. She she, she apparently was five hundred pounds, and, and and the faith healer prayed over her, and and she apparently lost two hundred pounds on the spot. 
That was my favourite miracle that I heard about. Uh, I'd take 50. I'd take 50 if I could. Yeah. Uh, there, there, there was one fellow, one fellow, who, who uh, his, his claim was, his name was William Branham, William Branham, and his claim was he had the gift of uh, prophecy, discerning of spirits, and he, he said that he could walk into a room and he said it was like peering over your neighbour's fence. He said you could, you could peer over just like you can see what's in your neighbour's backyard. He said I, I could look into people's souls and hearts and, and, and just tell them what was happening in, in their life. But you know, let me tell you something. Demons know what's happening in people's lives. Demons know that too. Not just God that knows what's going on in different people's lives. And, and so this was very odd, strange Stuff and again, he was one of many who, who in the end couldn't preach a straight salvation message, right? Uh, by their fruits, you will know them. You'll know them. <clears throat> As uh, one writer said, a wolf may disguise himself; a tree cannot. Cannot do it. Noxious weeds like thorns and thistles simply produce, simply cannot produce edible fruit like grapes and figs. Then let's look at the last part of Matthew 7 that we're looking at tonight from 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now, this is just what James was telling us this morning. That faith without works is dead. Those who do the will of my Father in heaven. It's interesting. Interesting. Because at the end of time, so to speak, and, and when people stand before God, there will be many who did use Jesus' name somehow. They did use his name. And in verse 22, many will say to me in that day, and, and, and look at what they're boasting about. Prophecies, casting out demons, many wonders. Many wonders. Interesting, isn't it? They don't talk about... Their evangelism, they don't talk about the poor they help, they don't talk about, you know, and it, but, but it's about all of these amazing things. Amazing things. What's Jesus' answer? He says, I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Now, this is important because uh, they never lost salvation because they never had it in the first place. They didn't lose anything. It's like they lost it. They never had it. Right? I never knew you. That was the issue. And he says, depart from me, ye who practice lawlessness. And, you know, this may not even be immorality or, you know, riotous behavior. These are just, you know, people who are, are living according to their own imaginations. They equated Christianity with the prophecies, the, the exorcisms, and the wonders. <laughs> that's, that's, that, that, that was their view of what a Christian was. That's what it was. And Christ says, I didn't know you. You used my name. You used my name, but I didn't know you. Jesus said, there, there, there are many who will do that. Many. Uh, John Phillips is a very, very good writer. He, he talked about the narrow way in Matthew 7 and he said there's no implied promise that we can have the best of both worlds. You can't have everything. You can't have everything. He says there's no intimation of Jesus, no suggestion that we can go on living the same old way 
and still be sure of heaven. Now, that, that's exactly in accord with what Jesus says in Matthew 7. And, 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 and Christ does many things in the Gospels, but one thing he does do fairly consistently is he warns us. He warns us. It's not just something that, that Paul does, right? You know, don't, don't think, oh, it's it Paul that's the one that's warning all the time, or James. No, no, Jesus was doing this too. He was telling us to be concerned about the truth. Does the way feel narrow tonight? Well, I'm glad our Lord told us it would be. He told us it would be. But guess what? It leads where? To life. To life. Eternal life. And, and we can live with the narrowness, at times the, what feel like restrictions, if we know the way leads us home to the Lord.